This image appears at the beginning of the film and each performance of the show. As you can see behind the title, the backdrop reads Newsboys Lodging House. Throughout this lecture, I'll be pointing um, here and there to the ways in which the set and stage represents New York at the turn of the century and the lives of the Newsies. In this way, we've already talked about um, how the lodging house was depicted in the 1992, or yeah, the 1992 film, um, and how this is historically accurate. Um, the set throughout the production includes many metal props pointing to the industrialization of the era. In the opening scene, the viewer meets Jack Kelly and Crutchy, roommate newsies who live on a rooftop. From the very beginning, this Jack Kelly is vastly different from the one in the 1992 film. First of all, his dream of going to Santa Fe, Santa Fe is not his own secretive dream that he keeps to himself. Instead, this Jack Kelly is expressive in his hope to escape the city for a rural life. Um, he even says, Crutchy, come with me. Like, your leg will be better when we're in Santa Fe. Um, Crutchy questions this dream at first, and he says, but everybody wants to come to New York. And Jack responds, you keep your big life in a small city. <sighs> I completely butchered that. <laughs> you keep your small life in a big city. Give me a big life in a small town. This exchange points to the idealized truths of 1899. Crutchy recognizes the high demand of urban living and the um, increase in immigrants entering New York from other countries. Nevertheless, Jack is not satisfied with his life and has the American dream to move west due to mythologized yeoman and yeomanry. Secondly, Jack reveals that he is orphaned when he talks about how the streets down there suck the life right out of his old man, but they ain't doing that to him. There will be no secret identity behind this Jack Kelly. He tells his story right away. Some changes are minor to the plotline, such as the fact that in 1992 film, Jack, David, and Les run from Snyder during the day into the theater and at night the boys go to the Jacobs home for dinner. In this adaptation the boys finish their work day and David and Les invite Jack to their home when they find out that he doesn't have folks. This invitation is derailed though when they run into Snyder. They flee into the theater where they meet Miss Meta Larkin. She, like Jack's character, has undergone major changes. Instead of the thin, white, red head we saw in the 1992 film, this Meta is a black, plus-size woman. She has all the lively attributes and attitudes of the 1992 Meta, but her physical change gives the story another, deeper element. She is representative of agency in her life as a black woman through owning property, which is the theater or the burlesque house, and working as an entertainer. She even makes a statement, quote, theater is not only entertaining but educational, which is a subtle nod to the show's historical aspect. Um, in this scene, she is also reveals that Jack is an artist. Um, he paints the backdrops used in the theater and is reluctant to accept any payment from Meta for it. This is also a new element of Jack's character. In the 1992 film, he was just a newsie, but here is Jack, this vivid dreamer who is also a budding artist while selling papers. I mean, it really insinuates the fact that he doesn't really belong in this life. We'll see if this ends the same way, but this Jack is very, very different than the 1992 Jack Kelly that we discussed in large detail in the last section. After Meta performs a song, Jack sees a girl he spoke to earlier in the day prior to buying his papes. She's seated in a private box writing a review on the show for The Sun. At this point, she is still unnamed. In the theater, just as he did on the streets, Jack openly flirts with this female reporter who quips back at him in annoyance repeatedly. We know that female reporters were rare at this time as a new, um, were rare, but they were real 
um, at this time, as the New York Times reported in um, one of the articles that we look closely at in the first section, um, I think specifically in Lecture 1, about the Irving Hall rally, there were two women present at the Irving Hall rally that were reporters. Um, I'm going to include in this project, outside of this lecture, a video um, of this Newsies cast where the actress who plays um, this, rep this female reporter, um, who will come to know as Catherine Plummer, talks about how she felt Catherine's character was similar to the real-life Nellie Bly, an American journalist whose work took place across the 19th and 20th centuries. As you might guess, Catherine's character is a replacement for Brian Denton. She catches on to the Newsy strike fever and helps through her publications to bring justice to the Newsies. She also catches a love for Jack, as we'll discuss further in our analysis of the stage adaptation. Um, at the end of this scene in the theater, Jack sketches out a drawing of Catherine on a leftover newspaper, leaving it for her to find on the stool in her private box. I tried finding a better image that really shows this sketch, but this was the best I could find. So if you look at Jack, he's holding a folded newspaper. This is what he is drawing on, but his sketch is projected behind him and Catherine. So if you are watching this as an, an audience member on stage, you see Jack and Catherine in the foreground uh, underneath them because they're in the air above like on a balcony a private box balcony underneath them you see the burlesque women performing and a few rows of men viewing that performance um, but then behind them in the background behind Jack and Catherine and the performance going on in the foreground in the background you can see Jack actively sketching this image of Catherine so with this inadequate image, I'm going to try and show you. Um, if you look at Catherine's stage left shoulder, so when you're looking at this image, her right shoulder, um, in the foreground is, um, I guess in the background, is Jack's sketch of her chin. Um, you can see this. If you look right at the tip of her shoulder, you'll see the it's tan and then there's a dark, um, black or brown line. That line is the outline of her chin. About half an inch up from her chin, her chin is the bottom of her lip. Then the background breaks the sketch the way that it's set up. There's, um, it's set up into like squares. Um, so there's a line of this square that's throughout the whole show that breaks his sketch. But the bottom of her nose is at the very top of this frame. If you're looking at this image, you can see the top of her nose. I'm sorry I couldn't find a better image. Hopefully you can still play I Spy and try to find um, the image of Catherine behind her actually standing at a profile. So this image, a much better image, um, shows the Newsies waiting at, a, at the circulation gate for the headline to display. Just as in other film, the price raise occurs and the decision to strike is made, um, which very closely resembles the 1992 film in terms of plot and character involvement, so we're not going to get too deep into that. Um, the female reporter appears, introducing herself to Jack as Catherine Plummer. Um, with some hesitance, as if she's sure that really isn't her name. She's teased by Jack, who questions whether girl... She is teased by Jack, who questions whether girl reporters write hard news. Um, he even says, isn't your beat entertainment? And because, you know, she'd been reviewing, um, like, burlesque shows. And she tells him, without backing down, that times are changing. She eloquently fights for her ability to write their story because she believes in it. Um, there's no scene between the Manhattan Newsies in Brooklyn as there was in the 1992 film. Instead, the Manhattan Newsboys relay word that Spot Conlon says he'll join with proof that they won't back down and the other Newsies like Harlem and Queens will join if Brooklyn is in support. 
Um, this is actually more fitting, I think, to historical accuracy. As we mentioned in Lecture 1, there was a system of communication in place. The fact that we don't see any of the inner workings of the network is more indicative of the power word of mouth had in the original strike. Um, scabs are confronted and persuaded um, to join the strike, and this is a major difference because no child laboring scabs were soaked in this production on stage. Instead, on this same day, the soaking sessions occur between the adults and the newsies, um, and this is what leads to Crutchy's arrest. If you think back, um, all these events were further spread out in the 1992 film. On one day, the newsies soaked the scabs. Um, I, I feel like maybe they threatened them at first, and they were like, you know, you don't, don't do this, like, don't sell the papers, and they... The scabs were like, no, like, you're insane for striking. I'm going to sell papes. I'm going to make my pennies. And then they they actually get in a brawl. They soak the scabs. Um, and then once they've taken care of the scabs, they go to destroying the newspapers and the, the tipping the wagons, which is incredibly accurate, to 1899. Um, and then it wasn't until the following day that, Pulitzer sends out the adults. Now, we talked about how Pulitzer didn't really send out the adults to attack the Newsies. He sent out the adults to sell papers, and then the Newsies attacked those adults. But still, this the way in which this stage adaption puts all these events close together, um, it, and the fact that they don't commit acts of violence against the other child laborers, the scabs, is completely inaccurate. Um, so it is in these ways, the fact that these events all happen seemingly as once without, you know, different days associated to each event and that the violence is only enacted against adults and not child labor against other child laborers, you know, newsy, striking newsy against scab. Uh, the stage adaption removes much of the 1992 film's original accuracy regarding 1899. It's also at this point, after the adults have taken to beating the children, that the police show up. As we talked about in Lecture 4, the police weren't historically active in arresting children or intervening to stop soaking newbies, to stop what the soaking newsies were dishing out. <laughs> and in the 1992 film, the police weren't present until the Irving Hall rally. But on stage, they appear as another adult force of brutality against the Newsies right away. Another change that occurs, this one is better in my opinion, <laughs> um, is after the arrest of Crutchy, um, Jack sings again in longer form of his dream to get out of New York and go to Santa Fe. I feel like I can't get through this without expressing how much I love this change in Jack's character in which uh, his his dream is so much more at the forefront in this production and each each rendition of Santa Fe the original like the Santa Fe prologue that we see at the very beginning and talked about in slide two and now this version of Santa Fe they each tell the same basic story that Jack wants to he has this other dream he doesn't want this life but they're different because at the beginning it was this dream that he wanted and desired he still got up and went to work every day but it was just something that he wanted it was something he could dream about for his future but here after seeing his friend completely beaten I mean many of his friends beaten by adults the police come and one of the newsies, I believe his name is Romeo, he cries, thank you, like, thank God you're finally here, they're slaughtering us, referring to the adults, and the police officer hits him. I mean, and I'm pretty sure there was a similar scene in the 92 film, but I mean, these events are brutal, and when Jack sees this and sees Crutchy literally be hit and drug away to the refuge, He's no longer just wanting and desiring of this dream. He is desperate and pleading for a change in his life from where he is stuck in New York. He has no room to grow in this big city. It 
I mean, it's really heart-wrenching, and I feel like it's so similar to the way we talked about in Lecture 2 regarding child labor, how the yeoman life was mythologized and idealized, and this is what is happening to Jack. He sees this work as better, this rural agricultural work as better, and as a real means of working for a valuable life and future. I mean, he, he at never does Jack say, you know, I want to stop working. I just want to be lazy and I want to be a kid. He does speak for kids. You know, they should be able to go to school if they want to go to school. And why are kids supporting their parents? But that's not what he wants. He knows he doesn't have parents. He's not trying to support a family. He's an orphan. He wants to support himself and he wants to have a life of value as opposed to being trapped in a life of lousy headlines and pennies earned on the street. As Act 2 begins, Catherine covers the strike for the Newsies before Pulitzer puts out his print on strike bans. We saw this same thing in the 92 film and discussed um, this ban as inaccurate. Um, there's three things I find significant about this scene where the Newsies um, find out about the cover story and sing The King of New York. Um, one is that when one of the newsies sees the front page article, he cries, wait till my old man sees this. I won't be last in line for the tub tonight, which illustrates the very real reality of newsies from 1899 as having homes to return to. Um, while his family may not be as financially stable as David and Les's family, for instance, um, at least how, however financially stable they were before, um, their father was injured. It still demonstrates the Newsy as having a family to support and live with. Um, the second concept is that Jack is not present in this scene as he was in the 1992 film. Um, and thirdly, lastly, the boys declare that alongside their achievements of becoming Kings of New York, Catherine is also titled a King of New York. This illustrates a growing acclaim for young women in a creative workforce rather than working in the mills or of factories. If you look at the image from this scene, you can see how the signs above the performers indicate places around town and the big industrial set that is used throughout um, the performance as the major, the major like prop. Um, is visible. I mean, similar props are available or seen throughout the performance. Um, one of which you saw in the beginning of this um, lecture, where Crutchy and Jack live. Their rooftop is a part of this. Um, there are other instances where, like the the lodging house itself, is one of these um, industrial-looking sets. I mean, Snyder chases the boys. If you look at this image, you can see all the different ways to get up and down the stairs and stuff. I mean, Snyder chases them into the theater through one of these systems. Um, but I think the the industrial aspect of the stage performance, in the 92 film, you get a sense of the New York you're looking at. You know, and I included those images of, like, the Brooklyn Bridge and... Um, and such throughout that you get to really see New York and see these boys taking on um, like a real place whereas here it's it's not the same on stage but I think that this industrial setup um, does a really good job of showing you know the, kind of the coldness that that they're fighting against and that kind of the country is in the midst of um, in this era um, so yeah, the industrial set is visible in the background in those placards above where the Newsies are dancing with Catherine are ways in which New York is, in a sense, captured for the stage. When we see Crutchy at the refuge, he isn't being visited by Jack. He is instead writing a letter to him about his shared dream of going to Santa Fe. Um, when we see Jack next, he's hiding out, working on painting backdrops in the theater, and he claims he did go to see Crutchy after he got his letter, but um, we don't see that interaction as viewers. He states that Crutchy was so injured he couldn't even come to the window, 
Jack is discouraged at continuing to strike because he doesn't want anyone to be hurt or die as a result. Jack says that, quote, every newsie who could walk was back on the streets selling papers like nothing ever happened, um, end quote. This isn't historically true. It, it does happen in this film, but it's not historically true. The newsies were very adamant, right, about being on strike and on strike and staying on strike and if you were selling papers you were a scab and you got soaked um david responds to jack's statement that many newsies were there including himself and they were going to sell papes but a lot of them just like him ended up leaving they're just worried about supporting their families again this isn't something that jack i mean it's something he recognizes and he knows but it's not something that he's concerned about so he's ready to step back um, David and Catherine want to organize the Irving Hall Rally, which isn't called the Irving, um, Hall Rally in this film. Um, it doesn't take place in that same hall. We looked at in, um, the past film about how, uh, under Miss Meta's image, there was the, the Irving Hall was written on the, um, the front of the theater. This isn't the case here. Um, Meta's theater is really just um, a burlesque house. Um, Jack doesn't want to continue striking or to organize the rally, um, showing Dave and Catherine his other artwork. He spins the, the um, landscape that he's been painting of Santa Fe over, and it shows this image that's here on this slide, which is a... Um, a backstage photo but the artwork is Pulitzer's boot crushing the Newsies and um, unlike the landscapes he has painted for Miss Meta or the portrait sketched of Catherine this drawing looks more like a political cartoon which I'd like you to keep in your head um, as we move for further in our analysis of this film um, but nevertheless despite Jack's hesitancy Dave convinces Jack that they've already scared Pulitzer and that they actually have a chance while Disney avoids showing the ways in which the Newsies were violent in their strike, the act of persuasion through communication and organization of the rally does address that element of communication that was present in the 1899 strike. In Pulitzer's office, Catherine appears while Pulitzer discusses with his employees. Um, take note that the redhead here is an employee of Pulitzer that is not Catherine. Um, along with his employees is the mayor... Um, and Snyder. Um, Snyder is in this scene addressing Jack's criminality. This is something that is quote unquote hidden about Jack. Um, I'd mentioned, you know, that he, he lays it all out. He tells this story right up front. He really does. Um, this criminal behavior, just as in the 92 film, isn't indicative of um, his character. It's just acts that have happened for the sake of others and we'll talk about it more later but Snyder states that um Jack quote was first sentenced to my refuge for loitering and vagrancy but his total disregard for authority has made him a frequent visitor as after his release I caught him red-handed trafficking stolen food and clothing he was last sentenced to six months but the willful ruffian escaped end quote Yes, here again, Jack escaped on the back of Roosevelt's carriage. This has been um, kept in this story. Um, it's been mentioned earlier in the film, but I just want to clarify that, yes, that's still his legacy. Um, Jack shows up in this moment to Pulitzer's office, coming to invite Pulitzer to the rally, something that never happened in 1899 or in the 92 film. Um... And it's in this moment that Jack discovers that Catherine Plummer is really Catherine Pulitzer. She's working for the Sun because she wanted a career over her father's wishes for her to live a life of leisure. Pulitzer then reveals that Snyder is there as well and makes an offer. Attend the rally and speak against the strike and as a reward Jack's criminal record will be expunged and he can leave New York with cash in his pocket. This is a similar deal offered to Jack in the 92 film, except it comes before the rally rather than after. 
Um, in the 1992 film, Jack really did follow the narrative of the real kid Blank working as a scab on the streets. But here, Jack deviates even further from Disney's original kid blinkery. <laughs> He's asked to speak out against the strike at the rally where the real kid Blink actually spoke in favor. Um, it's also important to note that um, the revealed identity isn't of Jack's character. I mean, yes, I mentioned, you know, the criminality wasn't something that was up front, but instead the real, like, <gasps> shock of it all <laughs> is um, Catherine's revealed identity in this adaptation. Um, this is also devi uh, deviation from the ways in which Disney was um, working alongside historical truth in Kid Blink's narrative in the 92 film. Along with Pulitzer's offer, Jack is... Um, also threatened um, that the other Newsies will be locked up in the refuge. So Jack is taken to the cellar by the Delancey brothers, who are also still here but seemingly irrelevant if you ask me, um, and he sleeps on the offer on top of an old news press. For the rally, the Bo Brooklyn Newsies finally arrive, led by Spot Conlon. In 1992, their arrival took place when the Newsies first faced the adult attack. This is somewhat accurate because um, this being the fact that the Newsies are at least here by the rally is accurate because by the time the rally took place, Brooklyn and the other Newsies were behind the boycott in their support. You can see in this image the different groups of Newsies present and prepared to rally as indicative by their signs. Um, Jack arrives and he has taken Pulitzer's offer. He um, He's fallen off strike fever at this point twice. Once when he didn't want to rally and again when he takes Pulitzer's offer for Santa Fe. Uh, we know that David Simmons and Kid Blink were leaders who turned traitorous. But the strike continued on due to the initial influence of their leadership. Uh, Jack speaks out. He says, you know, we've been good. We, sh we struck. We did what we needed to. But I've talked to Pulitzer. It's time we go back to work. And everybody calls him a traitor. But then it's even more evident that he has um, sold out when an employee of Pulitzer delivers a stack of money to Jack at the rally. And he is exposed as a traitor to the others. Jack returns to his rooftop home. To find Catherine there. Um, she found the drawings that he has kept hidden. I guess you could say another hidden aspect of Jack's character. Maybe I'm wrong in assuming that he lays it all out in the beginning, but I'm, I really do think that this is different. <laughs> um, so she found the drawings of the refuge and uh, they, you know, illustrate the living conditions of the refuge. She realizes that Jack stole the food and clothes for the boys in the refuge and calls Jack out for his hypocrisy. I mean, she doesn't back down. She says, if you're willing to go to jail for those boys, how could you turn your back on them now? He flips the table, <laughs> calling her out on her secrecy of being a Pulitzer and not a plumber. Um, they go back and forth. They may kiss. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but um, eventually Catherine reveals her idea to print the children crusade for other child laborers to read and hear along with Jack's drawings. Jack realizes that they can use the printing press that is in the cellar um, and the plan is set in motion. That is after the two discuss their feelings for one another. Um, whereas in the 1992 film the love story was basically non-existent between Jack and Sarah. Um, this unusual courtship between Jack and Catherine basically has its own plot line. Um, I know many people are going to say, you know, this is silly and it's a like it's not needed for this story. Um, it's just a love story. Newsies weren't falling in love. Um, I kind of agree. It is a little silly. It is a little, you know, romanticized Disney. But... Um, I think it's also incredibly powerful in expressing the two individuals' ability to express their own care for one another with full disclosure. Um, and at this point, there is full disclosure. I mean, his secret of being 
you know, having a criminal record is out, um, and her secret of being a Pulitzer is out, so they can, you know, fully express their care for one another, despite the unpleasant pasts that they both individually have, and, you know, these truths about their lives that they wanted to keep hidden. Um, so I think the scene in many ways humanizes these characters, and the song is really nice too. The Newsies banter is print banter. <laughs> the Newsies banner <laughs> is printed with help from Catherine um, and her friends Darcy, who is the son of um, the owner of the Tribune, and Bill, the son of William Randolph Hearst. These characters we know aren't historically based regarding the strike of 1899. I didn't really research whether these people really existed. Um, I don't know if Catherine existed herself, but in it doesn't matter because in regards to the strike of 1899, they were irrelevant. Um, nevertheless, the Newsies, um, the 1899 Newsies' own union papers are historically accurate. While the distribu distribution of this banner wasn't the selling point to end the strike, um, the loss of circulation was very real in 1899. Um, Sites, when um, Jack goes to reconfront Pulitzer, Sites shows all for his success, just as he did in 1899, and just like he did in the 1992 film. This is all accurate. Um, Governor Roosevelt arrives to Pulitzer's office alongside the mayor, Miss Meta, and Catherine. He encourages Pulitzer to end the strike in compromise unless Pulitzer wants a full state senate investigation on how he treats his employees. We can read this as a subtle nod to the NCLC's investigations that eventually led to the quote-unquote end of child labor. Jack negotiates with Pulitzer, bringing the price of papes down to 55 cents per hundred, so a five-cent reduction to the original raise, and he agreed to buy back the unsold papers. This half is true. You know what I mean? Like, this is partially true because in 1899, Pulitzer agreed to buy back the unsold papers, but the 60 cent wholesale price remained in effect. So, Disney kind of did it right. And I am happy that in this adaptation, they talk about how the strike was resolved. It really irritated me that it was never explicitly stated in the last um, Disney depiction. So the Newsies are informed of their victory, and Roosevelt makes an inspirational speech to them about their prosperous future. This kind of, you know, goes against child labor, um, as we talked about in Lecture 2, but we'll take it. It wouldn't be a Disney film without an inspirational speech somewhere. Um, the refuge, due to Jack's drawings, is closed, which leads to the release of children, um, and Crutchy, again, our dearest Crutchy is back. He's reunited with Jack. Um, Snyder is arrested. Jack is offered, now this is the new part, Jack is offered a political cartoonist job from Pulitzer. All of these things aren't accurate, you know, regarding the refuge and um, the arrest of a refuge overseer or, you know, Kid Blink or Jack or whoever, any newsies. Um, you know, higher employment with Pulitzer, those are all inaccurate, but the inclusion of the cartoonist job does illustrate the power that art has in cultivating change in a society. And if we think back to the, the, um, image that Jack, uh, drew on the back of one of his landscapes of Pulitzer's boot crushing the Newsies, they're pretty evocative. So just as in the 1992 film, um, Jack's real dream is fulfilled. He has a girl on his side that he believes in and who believes in him. Um, he has opportunities, you know, this cartoonist job has given him a chance to possibly grow um, and give him a valuable future that he really, really wanted. And as well, he has a brotherhood and family in his newsboys. Overall, in regard to plot lines and characters, the 1992 film did a better job at depicting the Newsboy Strike of 1899. The changes made that we discussed throughout this production tamper with the history um, that you know we tracked in Lecture 1, this adaptation just doesn't do the same 
the same justice that the 92 film does. While the 92 film gets many things wrong, I think it does a better job. I feel like when Disney made this film, or this show, stage production, they looked a lot toward the first film in order to make it better, which I think they did. I think that this film overall, in regards to music and production, we're going to talk a lot more about music um, too, but I think that this one's better. This one's more fun to watch for me, the, um, the stage adaptation, but I think if we're only looking at historical accuracy, the 92 film does way better. Um, the best change um, that is made and that works the best in the stage adaptation is um, Santa Fe and the way that that concept of Santa Fe is integrated throughout the stage performance. It allows the theme of the American dream to shine brighter.